Um, I'm with Kristen. She is working as a long-term missionary in a closed country in the stands. And I want to, you know, hear from Kristen your thoughts on this idea of like, what is missions? And um, here's a quote that I love, and I want you to tell me what you think. Um, you are either a missionary or a mission field. And mm. Let's let's start with that in mind and talk about like what is missions and and is there a difference between local missions and global missions? Yeah, absolutely. That is such a good question. Uh, so I think the first question or the first thing that needs to be defined is like access. So in terms of missions, um, we are talking about crossing a cultural and linguistic barrier. Um, and we are going to people who, uh, when we talk about unreached, it means that there's not enough Christians in a given cultural population to evangelize the rest of the group. Um, and so that's going to be very, very different in terms of, uh, let's see, like Virginia. Um, we have tons of churches. Your likelihood of meeting a Christian on the, on the street is astronomical. Um, the Bible is in your own language. There is a church that's in your own language. You really can take your, your pick of whatever church that you'd like to go to. And so when we're talking about missions, I really think you need to zoom in on access. People in Virginia, not that the lost are not unimportant, like, like don't, don't hear what I'm not saying. The Lord's heart is for the lost, regardless of your unreached or not. Um, but there is a difference between the guy who sleeps underneath the bypass and the person who works at the Dukon down the street from me here in the middle of the stands in terms of how is this person going to hear the gospel? Are they going to hear the gospel in their own language? Is there a church that, uh, that they could actually attend? Things like that. And so when we're talking about missions, I'm thinking about who has access and who doesn't. Um, I don't personally have a problem with if you, if you want to call it home missions or, or stateside missions, that's okay. Um, but I would just challenge you, um, to wonder about, to wonder about access. So, okay. Okay. Kristen. So like, what, what is the issue of getting this wrong? Yeah. So I think what happens is, is that we do not allocate resources to the places where it needs. Um, so when I think about somewhere like South America, we have a really strong indigenous church. We have churches, we have pastors, we have training centers, we have um, enough, enough Christians uh, to be able to evangelize the rest of um, the rest of the area or the rest of the cultural group. Um, and when I think about the work that needs to be done there, I guess my biggest question would be, why can't someone who's local be doing what this person may be doing who works in South America? Why can a local not be training other pastors? Why is there not a, a local person who is the pastor of a church? Um, just when I think about that, I'm thinking about, hey, the church is already strong. The church can do what the church needs to do. Um, and we can move forward with, um, with reaching the unreached. And so when I'm talking about the unreached, I'm talking about people who don't have a church to go to. We are talking about people groups that do not even have scripture in their own language. Can you imagine like picking up a book in China, like the, the Bible in Chinese and trying to become a Christian, trying to understand the heart of God, trying to understand anything and you're reading it in Chinese. It just, it doesn't work. And so when I think about when we're allocating resources, um, I do think that the, the unreached do need um, adequate resources and we don't see that they do. We don't see enough people working with the unreached. We have people who are fulfilling secondary roles of pastors or pastor trainers or kids group directors and things like that. And yeah, my biggest question would be, hey, if the church is established, let the local church be the local church and then take those people um, and bring them somewhere where we don't have that. We don't have um, disciple makers. We don't have pastors. We don't have um, X, Y, and Z. So yeah, I think the danger, the danger in that is just, yeah, when we're talking about resources, where do we want to put, where do we want to put our time and our effort? Yeah, no, that's great. That's great. Right, let me hit you with another one. Short-term missions trips. Do like what? What are your thoughts? And and I'll I'll ask you some more on this. But like, 
um, ready, set, go. Yeah. So for short-term trips, um, just to be honest, if you are going on a service trip um, to somewhere, um, yeah, I would just ask what is the sustainability of having a group of foreigners come in and do the work that could be that could be paid to a local whose job that that is, <laughs> right? There are painters, there are house builders, there are church builders, there are septic tank guys, there are people um, that we could be we could be empowering to work and to love on their church by doing those things that the church needs um, and not having a foreigner. Um, when we look at the model of um, when we look at the model in Acts, we see that they're like, oh no, the Gentile, like not the Gentiles, but this, these group of women, um, they are like their needs are not being met. They're going hungry. And so the apostles are like, okay, we're going to appoint people to do this. And so that's not to say that um, these kind of service things are bad, but they are not the primary work. Um, and so when I think about short-term trips, I think it's important. Um, I think that short-term trips should be for people who want to see if they want to do this line of work. Um, someone in South America does not need you to come build their church for them. Um, that local community needs to have that local builder build, build the church and be paid for it. Um, and so I would just say, yeah, if you're thinking about short-term trips, um, I would, yeah, I would move away from, um, from service trips, if at all possible, um, and really think about how do we make this sustainable? How do we make sure that this exists after we leave and that this doesn't fall apart after our Western money leaves the picture? All right. So one of the questions that comes up a lot, and I, and I think I've heard different takes on it. Um, and sometimes it's kind of at the like, why even send North American missionaries anymore? And other times yeah. it's like, hey, why wouldn't we do this this method, which makes sense, is strategic, is um, why not just send money and, and send out more local workers from a home country to reach their own people in lieu of sending costly uh, North American long-term missionaries? Why not just bring our missionaries back and send the money to those people and they can go a lot further, a lot faster in their own language than we could. Yeah. So I would definitely say that is something that um, I am still wrestling with. And so I, yeah, I'll just share a few thoughts, maybe some pros and some cons. Um, yeah. So pros is that um, a local who knows the language, who grew up in the culture will always do a better job of presenting the gospel than I ever can no matter how good my language is, no matter how long I live there, um, locals are going to be your church planners. Locals are going to be your church planting catalyst. Um, they, yeah, they're going to do that heavyweight lifting. Um, some of the cons that I think about um, are going to be a lot of like financial. Um, so when you think about, it's like, okay, is this, is this sustainable um, to bring outside money into um, into this economy, into this place, into this, you know, this local organization. Um, is that sustainable? What happens to that local worker when their support comes from the other side of the world? Um, the second question, um, kind of the second con that I, that I see um, is when locals are, uh, let's say we'll use a, a definitive example, when there's a, there have been pastors who, you know, they, they pastor a small congregation. And so um, the pastor ends up getting support from America or somewhere in the West. Um, and so what happens is, is it really stunts the growth of the church because really the command to tie this is really, is really important. Um, and when you think about developing that muscle of tithing for new believers, if I'm sitting in that church and I'm seeing my pastor get paid with outside money, the question then becomes like, why, well, why would I ever need to tithe? He, he gets his money where he needs it. I would say the third thing that I think about um, is that if you start to pay certain local, like certain people to do certain jobs then other people who may also be really good at that job will never start the job because they think that they should be paid for it. So when we think about disciple making, everybody should be a disciple maker. 
everybody, like no matter where you are in the world, you should be a disciple maker. And it's like, if I decide that I'm going to support this local, I really see that he is making disciples. He is sharing about his faith. He started a home Bible group and he wants to quit his job so that he can do this full time. The money would then come from the outside. Um, the question becomes, how will he motivate other disciples to be disciple makers if he's the only one who's being paid for it? Um, and so those are just kind of the things that I'm thinking about. Those are not, um, yeah, those are not fully thought out. There are much smarter people who could answer a lot better, but those are just kind of some things that, that we wrestle with. And yeah, I mean, I definitely think they're, yeah, there are different, there are different positions, different things. Um, but I would be, yeah, I would I would be lying if I said that I had a definitive answer, but those are some of the things yeah. I'm thinking about. No, no, I appreciate your 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 transparent thoughts on it. I do think there's pros and cons. Um and I think a lot of the pros are just kind of practical, like they're very pragmatic. It makes sense yeah. on on paper. Um, but a lot of the cons are thinking in the long game and and what is the culture that we create, what is the dependency that we create? Are we yeah. are we actually creating a church planning movement? that's decentralized and doesn't depend on us and that that could continue to work even without us by doing that or are we creating something that's not ultimately healthy and and we're st we're building off of a bad foundation possibly yeah you know there there's a lot of questions that come into play i tend to lean towards you know there there may be times to leverage um funds to to get something going in unique ways but it's got to be in ways that doesn't create dependence you know, it needs to have a very quick exit plan and exit path, um, you know, and, and I, generally speaking, I do think it's better that we help local believers do what God's called them to do without those type of, of kind of um, incentives, if you will, yeah. uh, because what happens when we can't provide those incentives anymore? And to your right. point, what do the people around them think if they know that one person gets an incentive, but others don't, um, you know, so I, I tend to lean towards it's not the best. Um, it just makes sense on paper, um, but but not necessarily. Paper doesn't equal spiritual, you know. <laughs> yeah, um, and paper doesn't so, also equal the history of church planning. And unfortunately, yeah. um, using outside funds uh, has not worked out a ton <laughs> in in yeah. the most recent past for church planning. And so, yeah, I would I would definitely agree with with some with most of your sentiments. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for sharing your thoughts.